All right, it's six o'clock, and we are ready to go. Um, so tonight we have Charlie Devereaux with me. For those of you who don't know him, he was one of the founders of Double Mountain Brewery, which is in Hood River, and they have a, they have and they had in your day a very successful brew pub restaurant. So we're talking about food tonight which we all love and goes well with beer. And there's just a lot of good things to say about food and how that fits into your business model. So we're going to let Charlie take it away. I'll try the slides. And you guys, I think you want to let them interrupt? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Just uh, bring some questions come in. I think it's best if we, we can have a Q&A at the end, but don't, don't hesitate to just uh, load up a question as we're going on. And then with each slide, we'll take a break and take a look. Questions. Is that fair enough? Yeah, that okay, sounds good. good. So this is our last session, but it's one of the best sessions in terms of well, I like beer and food together. So I, I love this topic. It's a very important topic. Yes, yeah, so we both love this topic. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. We'll fire it up. Let's. Uh, you want to tell them a little bit about your history? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, for, uh, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with the scene here or, or the beer, you know, beer scene in Oregon and stuff. Um, my background is I started brewing 20 years ago, uh, and then seven years ago, I uh, hooked up with a friend to start a brewery uh, uh, right around the corner from a bigger brewery. We both worked at in Hood River, Full Sail Brewery. Um, I had actually left there and done some other things, including uh, coming to Portland State and doing the MBA program. And uh, when we started uh, the brewery, we were unsure about what our uh, what our scope would be and whether or not we would have a full-fledged brew pub. And honestly, the more that we looked at the numbers, the more we thought that it was something we had to do. And uh, uh, that was uh, kind of the factor of having two of us with families and trying to trying to get paid quicker because, you know, you, you, you open a restaurant and if all things go well, you're going to uh, get traction a lot quicker. So that was the biggest thing for us. And really kind of the whole thing of keeping people in the pub longer um, so we could sell them more beer. Uh, in the end, we were able to find a, a, a formula that made for a successful brew pub and uh, food started to become a big part of it. But, you know, one of the reasons we're talking about this here is because it is, it is a, a part of a, any business plan with a craft brewery you should consider. And I'll explain why. And also some of the challenges with which there are many. So let's uh, hop ahead. OK, so let's get right to it. So why have food? Um, uh, it's, it, long story short, uh, having food makes for uh, customers that are going to spend more money and spend more time in your establishment, almost uh, by definition. Um, it's also going to open you to bringing in customers that might be coming for the food and then have a beer. Uh, it's going to open uh, your avenues to um, being able to have a retail establishment that makes uh, more money. Um, and, you know, on top of that, I think that uh, the, having the, the, the pub is uh, kind of in the bigger picture, a very symbiotic way to market your brand. Uh, very synergistic in that um, if you have a place that's a popular pub, you, you tend to, um, it, it tends to help the wholesale, just in terms of exposure. And then the wholesale will help the pub. Uh, it's just kind of a, an awareness piece. And it's very hard to do that in a small level with, with just a bar. And there's plenty of places that do it, and certainly plenty of places that do without that, that kind of wing of the business. But you know, here in Oregon uh, in particular, uh, because the rules are pretty liberalized for us in terms of being able to do uh, brewing, direct sales, beer to go, um, all kinds of different uh, avenues to uh, be able to get your product out there. You tend to find people kind of trying to exploit those as best they can and trying to create, uh, generate more revenue. Um, as uh, Emily says on the slides here, extended hours, yeah, you know, it's very hard to get people in just for to try your beer seven days a week without having um, a food offering. You know, most places that are just a tasting room 
uh, are unlimited hours. And sometimes that complaint is an advantage to the people running it. It's a little bit less complex, uh, a lot less complex. But uh, ultimately, you know, if uh, I, I'm, I'm certainly of the mind that the restaurant fees can be a huge benefit that should uh, always be weighed in the, the uh, plan of what you might hope to do, either not now, necessarily now, but at some point down the line. Um, third party distribution. Um, Nelly, remind me what we're talking about there. Well, I think that that's uh, taking some of the margin away when you get to sell more. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, that's really the biggest piece of why when we talk about having a pub, why we talk about making money, is that because you have a three-tier system in most, in, in certainly in every state in the U.S. Um, and, and, and certain other parts of the world, the, um, you have a tremendous competitive advantage uh, if you can uh, be your own middleman. Uh, I know in our case, uh, the pub that we had, we were in a small town, but we sold uh, over a thousand barrels of beer through our pub by the third or fourth year. <clears throat> Each of those barrels, there was about $80 that would have otherwise gone to the distributor. They went directly in our pockets. So do the math. That's, um, that, was a, that was a huge chunk of the profits. It really, it really uh, kind of leverages uh, the bottom line in a huge way if you don't have to. And it gives you certain competitive advantages against the people down the street. If all of a sudden the beer that you're pouring over your bar is effectively cheaper, you have um, you can do different things. You can charge less for it and uh, make your place a more higher volume. You have the freedom of having margin to work with. And I think that uh, uh, that's the real kicker, that I would always go to people who are kind of in the planning stages and say, have you thought about this, that this is an opportunity to make margin that you can't make in any other way. And uh, this will be your highest margin, most profitable sale you'll ever make is over your own bar at the, at the brewery. So it, it, it makes sense kind of by extension to say, how can I maximize that? And uh, which leads to the capital letters of profit, which is why we're all here in the business of beer class. So um, any questions kind of as we get going here? Feel free to hop in if there's anything that's not clear. Um, do you have anything? Oh, uh, well, Nicholas is just asking what's happening in Portland this weekend. I'll, um, Nicholas, can you send me an email and I will respond to you with everything I find about that. All right, so next slide. Um, one of the challenges that you'll find um, if, uh, in any kind of uh, business, I think, where you have wholesale and retail with the same product um, is uh, the accounting piece and how to treat the two entities. Um, um, Melanie, is this really, you want to kind of hop in here and explain a little bit? Well, we're going to be talking about this next week because we've been working a lot on the production side of the brewery when we've been doing our spreadsheets. But now we are introducing a new entity, which is the restaurant. So the restaurant has its own materials going into it. It's got the food, it's got its own labor and supplies and it's separate kitchen and bar equipment and a separate build out that's a lot more expensive than um, the kind of build out you do for just plain vanilla because on the restaurant side, it's gotta look a lot better. So what I've done is I've actually created a separate costing sheet for those of you who are interested in doing the restaurant, and you'll see that um, at the bottom of all the modules, and it's what we're talking about next week. So um, the restaurant really needs to have be treated separately, except for you've got this one thing passing between the two, which is the beer. Right. So that's that's, that's where it gets kind of sticky in terms of how you do your books, um, particularly your your income statement, your profit and loss statement of. Uh, how you account for that and how you show what your profits are. You, know, you can run it as two entirely separate businesses, but eventually you're sharing overhead at some point. You know, you're sharing you're sharing the building almost, you know, but by definition. You're sharing um, it, you know, uh, you, can, you can kind of piece out the insurance and other pieces like that, but you're you're ultimately sharing the marketing in some respect because you're, when you market a brand, you're not just marketing. If you have a pub, you're marketing basically the whole, the whole thing. Even if you might have a, an ad in a paper that shows a picture of your bottle, it's still your name. You're still trying to kind of build awareness for both sides of it. So, um, the uh, 
Sorry, you want to hop on the... Well, I was going to say, how, yeah. you want to tell them how you treated beer. Sure. Did the restaurant buy the beer from the brewery, or... Yeah. That's a good... We, this, this is kind of a management, um, something you run into when you start um, managing kind of the complexities of managing uh, your staff and, and in case of a restaurant. We had an ongoing discussion, and we never really quite resolved how we wanted to go about it, which was that on paper, we were making the beer, let's say we were making the beer for $50 a keg. Um, if we were to sell it to the restaurant for $50 a keg, or even for, for, uh, for a piece of, you know, at, at the cost of cost of goods sold, gosh, it would make the restaurant look really profitable because all of a sudden they're paying almost nothing for their beer. Um, at the same time, we didn't want to go the other way and say, well, if they were to buy it from a distributor, um, the cost would be $150 a keg, and then keep the restaurant to that uh, standard. Because that was a little bit unfair because we were, we were kind of using that, that gap, that margin gap, uh, as an advantage, in our case, to try and keep prices down and to price ourselves a little bit under everybody else. That by itself is going to kind of dig into the profits of the overall venture. So when we start kind of doing, you know, looking at the profit margin of the restaurant, one way is too much. The other way is maybe a little bit uh, unfair to the general manager of the restaurant because we're making decisions on how we're spending money that aren't really tied directly 100% to the restaurant. We always kind of came to a middle ground of let's charge, let's charge the restaurant what we're charging the distributor and just kind of split the difference. But Quite frankly, it's, it's, it's kind of creates a disparity and it makes it kind of a difficult piece for uh, the management restaurant because you really any man, any restaurant is really dependent on uh, managing margin, and so these decisions become very important decisions in terms of the management scope of how you set expectations and goals. Um, Ryan's asking, plus, doesn't all the profit go into the restaurant? That in terms of well, I mean, yeah, you know, let's let's put yourself in the situation of being um, uh, a brewery and brew pub owner. Uh, and what I say that what I mean is that uh, in our case, we were a, whole, a brewery that was doing wholesale production and running a brew pub, and that's not the case for a lot of places. A lot of places it would be if it's a brew pub, the kind of the the, the typical model of a brew pub was I'm going to sell everything I can here, and then if I have any left over, I'll sell it wholesale. Uh, the big development in the last 10 years really are places like the one that I ran where you're, you're really trying to do everything. You're trying to do both and um, uh, trying to kind of just maximize on both sides. So that's really what we're talking here uh, to, to clarify a little bit. Um, in terms of the, you know, it, uh, let's see, look at any questions here. And all the profit go into the restaurant. Um, I think he was talking to it when it was fifty dollars a keg. Correct. Yeah, yeah, so that made the restaurant look. Really it makes good. the restaurant look great because they're buying cheap beer. Yeah. Um, which is fine. I mean, that's what you should look at. That's the reason why you do it. Um, what we're really talking about here is an accounting issue and a management issue in terms of creating the numbers. So, um, like I said, there's it's just one of those kind of wrinkles that's that's very typical to the trade. And um, when you you start talking about the business of beer, it becomes something that we, we spend a fair amount of time trying to trying to set a standard that we work with. And I think that's a good kind of lesson in terms of management is you need you need numbers and controls and you need a methodology for measuring yourself and just you know in every respect that 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 we, you know is a is a way to gauge how well you're doing in terms of your profitability and uh, not just for yourself as the owner and all that, but in terms of managing um, your staff and getting them to focus on that as well. So I guess the thing is, um, Dennis is pointing out, do you have to have separate entities? If you, you could run them both as one, particularly yeah. if that's the only place you're selling them there. You typically run them as one. Um, if you're to split it, you might split the real estate out from the business side for tax reasons. But um, no, what we're talking about here is um, Typical joint where you're doing you're doing a little bit of both, um, and trying to, like I said, trying to create structure to the profit and loss statement, 
it's, if you think about it, most businesses are kind of in one direction that way. And the fact that we sell beer, you know, can sell beer for a different price to the wholesale versus the retail creates a little bit of an accounting issue. Um, and, and not really for your accountant, but so much as just for, like I said, for, for kind of managing and managing your performance. So a lot of places, though, will split the entities. Yes. Um, is all beer sold to the restaurant? Well, that depends. That depends on the kind of business you have. In a, the business that we had at Wasatch, we sold some of the beer through the restaurant and some of the beer through wholesalers. About 50-50. In your case, what was the split? Well, let's start. I mean, it got up to being 80-20 wholesale to retail. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, that's a not uncommon split yeah. once you get going. And you know, when you have it split like that, you really do have to look at them as two separate entities because they've got different types of labor involved. They've got different raw materials going into their two sides, and it's right. you want to manage to see like how is each of those sides doing in terms of their profitability? Where are we getting into some problems potentially with like too much labor going into the beer? You don't want to mix it all together when you're trying to manage the place. You're running. The thing is, you're running two separate operations under one umbrella, mm -hmm. and so coming up with a way to split them. Uh, without splitting them, if that makes sense, there's really no reason to run two entire, you don't really want to go all the way where you're running two entire separate uh, balance sheets and uh, income statements. That gets ugly because you're sharing resources too. Yeah. Um, John says, is it crucial if you don't plan to distribute a wholesale? No, I think at that point you just come up with your own, you know, here's my model and your beer is, uh, has a, is a, you know, there's cogs on your beer and and you go. I think that um, I don't know very many breweries that that simply do everything out of the house. But the ones that are smaller, that, that are, maybe it's a thousand barrel brewery, and there's been a bunch of, that have been. Uh, I know a number of brewers that are like, I just sell what I sell in the winter when I'm like, my place isn't crowded. It's kind of a crappy model because you're that it, it just is it's erratic and it, it, it doesn't necessarily make you a lot of money kind of ties the market over and keeps you fully tanks full. Um, I guess the reason we're focusing on this is because it's become such a kind of a de facto model for how most breweries run these days. Um, so uh, take it at, at face value that way. There are still plenty of places that are just breweries or just brew clubs. So Bo is asking, does 10 Barrel have a model like this with separate entities for having a brew club in Bend and Boise? Sure, they're treating them both separately. Well, uh, yeah, that's where you you know you have a bunch of different satellites. You start to get into a whole bunch of different dynamics. Um, but that's I mean this is what we're talking about. This is for instance this brewery Ten Barrel. They have they have a production facility. They have a restaurant. They have two restaurants each of which have um, well, the one in Boise has its own separate brewery, and um, I I think the other one the other one in Ben doesn't have a brewery. It's just a pub. Mm -hmm. um, think about it. There's a lot to kind of consider there, um, and I think the most important thing is to be thorough and to have a plan that you stick with that everybody can kind of buy into and understand. It's very easy at the top to kind of just want to kind of huddle with all those numbers, but they're, they're very valuable in terms of uh, managing, uh, like I said, managing uh, expectations and setting goals for your management staff. Uh, Dennis asked me if you're planning on running the pub as, as one at the beginning and eventually go to wholesale side of the business, should you separate from the beginning? Let me be clear, we didn't really separate. I mean, it's very, it's very hard it's really to... Accounting. It's accounting thing and it's kind of, it's very hard to do in something like QuickBooks in a, in a meaningful fashion uh, because it's, it's an income statement. What we typically would do is an offline, uh, we dump, dump it to Excel on a monthly basis and we would best inventory. And then we would essentially run two columns where we would, for every line on the on the profit and loss statement, we would assign a percentage to uh, brewery and a percentage to restaurant. And um, some of those are super obvious, like pub labor is all restaurant, food is all restaurant. We would come up with this kind of transfer on the beer to figure out, because we, you know, if you're selling the beer to the restaurant direct for 150 bucks a keg, then all of a sudden it makes the brewery profit, uh, 
cost of goods, the cost of them too. So, like I said, it, you have to come up with a we have to come up with a plan. But ultimately, then you then you get down into saying, okay, well, how much of the facility, like of the rent, goes to the brewery versus the pub? And these are all very kind of subjective things. It might sound simple, but it's not. Um, utilities, marketing, even. Uh, it's very hard to kind of quantify. But my point is, I think it's important to try and to come up with some kind of a standard so that you can get to a meaningful uh, set of prime costs for your restaurant, prime costs being cost of food and labor together, kind of the things you can really control. And um, uh, being able to have those benchmarks so you can track performance and try and improve it. What else we got? Uh, how is selling beer at wholesale real fun any different in the accounting process for selling a variety of items with different margins? Uh, it's not that different except it's the same item at a different price. Um, and uh, so from account, I don't think it's really an accounting issue. I think it's a management issue and being able to generate numbers for those different channels that make sense and are useful to you um, from a management perspective. That's my take on it. Yeah, and we have that. I mean, that's how we set up the spreadsheet at the end of um, 401 when we talk about distribution channels, like how much profit was going to come in and how much it costs to go through those in those different packages so that you could see if you split it into wholesale, retail, different packages under each one, you could see where your um, profits were going to shift if you shifted a little bit between those numbers. So I think you have the tools to look at that from in your business planning. Um, it will show you the uh, difference between these various channels. Okay, let's talk about more fun stuff than that. That's just accounting. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. I will reiterate, though. There's a reason why we bring it up is because it's one of these unique issues to our business that I think is super important to kind of understand. If we're going to talk about the business, we need to talk about those kinds of things. About what are the finer points of the, the business-specific management tools that you need to be thinking about. Ultimately, driving to profitability, which. Um, is uh, the other theme. I think that a lot of times that gets lost in the mix of the passion for craft brewing. So trust me, I'm as passionate as the next guy, but I was way more passionate about trying to, to create a, a profitable business so I could maybe sleep well at night. Um, but menu development, I think, is a great topic because especially these days, um, it seems like it's as open to interpretation and uh, uh, is kind of open to whatever you, you think it should be. I think in the past, both Melly and I started kind of an era where brew pubs were just kind of coming out. I and mean, brew pub was kind of a commodity, it was a thing that you were supposed to do. And these days, you're starting to see all different types of models that seem to be effective. Um, going through the slide here, well, certainly tried and true. Um, uh, uh, I think anybody who's has any interest in craft beer in America knows what a brew pub is by now. Um, which is uh, typically kind of somewhat a mixture between a sports bar and um, and a high volume rest, uh, you know, restaurant that's uh, competitively priced and typically has uh, food in a uh, middle price range. Uh, typically has a fryer. Typically has a lot of burgers and all that stuff. I can't speak for you, international folk. If you you yeah. probably don't have to have a burger, but you might have yeah. to have a sausage. <laughs> so uh, I think that that's that kind of talk. That's really where the majority of the action has been. Um, uh, outsourced uh, food trucks is a is a big trend here. I think it's a trend that's spreading across the country. You're seeing it in the major media, and it's starting to become a real viable option for for kind of um, having a virtual brew pub or a virtual restaurant uh, where you're you're providing just enough to keep people there, or maybe providing for a different type of experience that's more akin to a bar uh, where you would, you would really just, you're really driving for drinking and um, maybe a little something on, on the side. Uh, obviously, having food truck, uh, someone else run the restaurant, uh, lowers, your, your, uh, lowers your rent, uh, gives you probably can rent out the space of the food truck. Uh, you don't have to have all that space and uh, infrastructure and all the expense of running a restaurant, the staffing, and all of that. Uh, typically, though, 
that comes at the you know expense of actually making any money off the food. Uh, and last but not least, in terms of kind of the things that we see happening, um, breweries that are pushing towards uh, more higher end experience, and um, many of which kind of have a uh, base of uh, hub style food and kind of take it and amp it up. Uh, where um, Magnolia Group Hub is, a, you know, I think, a really good example and a, and a fairly long standing one of a place that kind of uh, really a, a bar, a brewery restaurant. At the best in the best way to describe it, um, and uh, I think that there, we're going to see more and more of that type of action here as America warms up to uh, higher expectations for food and uh, seeing that come into the, the beer world. Yeah, and I wanted to bring up a, a point. Um, this isn't necessarily beer centric. I know a lot of you are interested in cider, and now you're seeing a lot of the brew pubs in town are starting to carry some of the ciders. And then you're seeing some restaurants that are serving ciders with food that they think is important to match with ciders. So ciders really started to get into the game now with food, and it provides a lot different opportunities for things on your menu that will go well with cider. A lot of uh, there's a lot of different type of French food that has traditionally been served with cider, like crepes and um, you know cheese things. Ryan's pointing out this food truck agreement. I just yeah. want to mention that there can be a lot of, um, yes, you reduce your own risk by using a food truck to provide food. You reduce your own risk with sort of like you haven't had to go into a restaurant and go through all that messy restaurant stuff. But the food trucks have to be extremely predictable. And if that's not, if that's not the case, and I've seen this happen where the food truck didn't show up at several breweries where, um, which rely on food trucks for their uh, food, then they lose an enormous amount of beer sales the days that the food trucks don't show up. So if you can have some kind of agreement with a food truck that is a contract, you're probably going to be in better shape. I mean, I would suggest it just because of the problems I've seen with flaky food trucks. Flaky food trucks. Flaky food trucks. <laughs> it's a category. So, um, I will point out though that food truck is kind of a malleable term these days, mm -hmm. and that um, uh, there's lots of them that aren't anything even looking like a truck. It's really more like a shed uh, that's parked uh, in a parking a space shed. that you might be <laughs> taking data to just to assemble. But um, that I, I think that you know in those cases, my understanding is that yeah, you're coming up with some kind of a some kind of a, an agreement or a performance. Based agreement for you know uh, usually it'll be because the brewery has the space and, and basically can dictate a, a little bit of the terms. Um, there's a uh, I know of other breweries where it's uh, they kind of are playing into the food truck thing and they they're 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 twittering tweeting what the food truck is going to be on Thursday night. And, um, there's a brewery in in uh, seen it uh, back in Minneapolis recently that. It's you know a young brewery, and that's kind of part of the hip new game of their their strategy, is to do cool new things like have food trucks come outside, and it certainly has streamlined their business. They just have a big long bar, and they brew beer, and they're open a few days, four or five days a week, and they do great on those days, and they it really resonates with their younger crowd they're trying to reach. A brewery called Saint Archer down in the San Diego area that has a sushi truck come every Thursday, and it's a, it creates a huge amount of uh, energy for, for their pub. In fact, I, I don't even know if they open without food. So, um, That's great. lots of cool stuff that people are figuring out that way now that food trucks are kind of a thing. Kind yeah. of like craft beers and thing. Bob's asking if we'd be liable for something that's <coughs> wrong with a food truck, like food poisoning. I don't know. I don't know. I don't where's think people where's are our lawyer when we need him? Marcus. <laughs> people aren't signing a waiver to go eat at the food truck, but um, I, I think that uh, that's a really good question. I went to this brewery and there was this truck there, and who am I going to sue? Isn't that that's the American way? Is who am I going to sue today? So I don't know. I don't. I don't know how many people places actually get sued for that, but but yeah, I mean that Melly kind of breaks a good point. You're part of part of the game plan for your brewery is how much control do I have over everything? It's nice to have control over those things, for better or worse. At least you're making the decisions. Um, that stuff can go sideways in a hurry. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, then you then you might not have any recourse or anything you can do about it except getting a getting a you know a, a, get in a battle with somebody who's in your parking lot selling selling cheesesteaks or something. So um, bring your own food. Ah, I like that idea. <laughs> I, I fortunately I just got back from a trip to Germany, and I really love the fact that a lot of the breweries had a little window next to the bar where you could order a beer and stand in the hallway and eat your own food if you wanted to, or or just stand around and and, and have a beer. I think there might be something uh, there. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's already happening in some place where bring your, bring your own food is part of the fun. So. Uh, yeah, John says different day, different truck. I think that's that could be super fun. And uh, as long as they're predictable, because yeah. the place I saw yeah. that had different day, different truck, that's when the trucks didn't show up. Yeah. So that it was uh, not you know occasionally a truck didn't show up on the day it was supposed to, and that is yeah. a weak link in terms of control. Yeah, and you know, but uh, then again, these days when you see a lot of small projects open up that are kind of stressed to the max on capital, perhaps or or really kind of just bootstrap ground you know, ground up operations. I think it would be pretty attractive to say, oh, I got, I'm going to have these food trucks and they're going to take care of that part of the business for me. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, I that having to rely on some guy that's in rely on the weather and rely on all those things um, are a bit of a disincentive, no doubt. So let's move on um, if we can. Oh, here we go. We got some more. Yeah, having food delivered is pretty neat too. I like that idea. That's uh, Brian and uh, Bailey's Taproom. Yeah, there's a lot of places uh, I think around. I mean, you know, like the Tornado, thinking of a pub model where the Tamale lady comes by and all that stuff. Uh, there's no, there's no hard and fast rules. But like, like I said, one of the reasons we're talking about the pub thing is that it's a very common practice and uh, that if done well, can really maximize your profitability. So, uh, moving on to a good new example of that. Uh, a colleague of ours, John Harris, just opened a brewery uh, for a case study. His uh, Melody is listed here. John, um, John uh, threw down a bit of a gauntlet and said uh, he wanted to be on the Eater 100 list for Portland, which is a pretty long list uh, and uh, competitive list. I thought that was a bold statement for sure. And um, as it says in the slide here, um, there is a big difference. You hire a GM and you hire a chef rather than a cook or or a team of people in the, the kitchen. Um, they have burgers as kind of mainstay of what they do. Uh, they have something like five or six of them, though, and they're pretty high burgers. Yeah. And they, uh, they have a very uh, extensive menu. Uh, and uh, they, uh, the, the biggest, uh, probably the biggest piece of their menu that's interesting is in the upper corner of the menu, they have eight different dishes that uh, rotate, uh, I think it's every six weeks. Sorry, six weeks or ten weeks. That are higher end, that are really kind of shooting a little bit higher, uh, and are seasonally focused. Uh, the, uh, I think that um, one of the things I will say is that uh, uh, size is a big factor when you talk about what food is going to work. There, there aren't a lot of restaurants in the world that are that are over twenty dollars a head that have more than hundred seats in them. Uh, there is uh, something about that experience that kind of discordant when you get into bigger restaurants. And you know, uh, in, I, I know there's been a bunch of breweries in the past that have kind of started off with a in the in the <coughs> golden golden days of the '90s, where the, uh, they uh, started with tablecloth service and and uh, more exclusive. And it's it's a little bit at odds with the typical impulse of a brewery to uh, uh, get big and to sell a, sell a fair amount of beer, you know, particularly with the profit motive of selling your own beer at this incredible margin. And just to be clear, what we're talking about in terms of the margin, okay, you sell a keg for, um, you make a keg for 50 bucks, you typically can sell it at the bar for 500 bucks. Um, and that is, so that's an outrageous profit margin, just kind of in strict cost of goods. Um, food typically you're somewhere in the food cost of it, just the food, um, not even cooking it is somewhere in the range of uh, you know anywhere between 25 and 35 percent. So uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the bar trade, um, it is a, a, a staggeringly huge markup in our market. 
uh, I was recently in Europe and they were asking me how to make money and I asked them what their market market was and typically their market was 100%. And I had to explain to them, well, ours is kind of more like 500 to 1,000%. And a typical bar is, is usually 3 to 400%. So um, I got their attention. And they were very depressed. <laughs> they didn't know what to do about it because they're selling beer for $2 a pint. Um, uh, one thing that, as it says here, is seasonal not getting as much as expected. I think that um, uh, that is one of the challenges, is that we do have a, um, you have this challenge of size. Um, it's, it's hard to run a big place with expensive food. Uh, beer is the common man's drink still, and uh, people, uh, there's an expectation that it's going to be at some level of an affordable night out. Uh, and uh, in John's case, I think that uh, it, it, it's a great test case because it's a brand new place, a guy who's been brewing for a long time, very well accomplished brewery, great plan, and really kind of uh, going out and making a statement and trying to make it happen. And um, uh, but also at the same time, really having a very big facility with a lot of seats. And so something to think about in terms of your planning. Is that it's hot? You can't have it all. Yeah. Uh, you can't have it all. It's uh, it's very rare that you can uh, say I'm going to defy expectations and have a big place that does um, really fancy food and uh, in this case and uh, have it really kind of be your focus. Yeah, I think that well, you see that the places that are really trying to push that, trying to have higher um, cost food, well, higher price food. And beer pairings, or you know, sell a lot of beer. They're all in the Bay Area right now. You can see them. Yeah. Monk's Kitchen, Abbott Cellar. I went to Abbott Cellar every night. They have a paired beer with their entrees, appetizers. It's like seventy-five dollars per person. It's a small place. They probably only have about forty seats. And you know, we'll see how it goes. You know, we'll see if they can survive in that. You know, trying to do the higher end food. Yeah. With the, Higher in beer. Developing, developing topic for <laughs> sure. The, uh, yeah, Stone's a great example of a place that I think Stone defies a lot of expectations. It's kind of the exception that proves a little sometimes. Um, they do everything large. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it obviously shows that you can pull stuff like that off. Um, they, um, uh, one of the things that caught my attention of a, a, a recent review of, of Ecliptic Brewery here in Portland by Michael Russell, the Oregonian's food editor. He, um, he, he, he said there were some issues, um, but at the end he said, you know, the fact that we're even talking about trying to be ambitious with food in a brew pub, he considered a success. <laughs> and certainly worthy of talk. So I think that I think the next 10, 20 years can be, uh, we could see things kind of the dominant paradigm start to shift a little bit. Mm -hmm. Ryan said that you do that on a more affordable scale. Yeah, with that, I think it's, there's, that's what's so wonderful about our food and, and beverage scene these days, uh, certainly here in Portland and, and, and trending nationwide, is that you're just starting to see so much excitement. I, uh, I, not to drop too many uh, quotes, but the other great one that I heard the other day, I read the other day, was from Gabe Rucker, a guy who runs Le Pigeon Restaurant in Portland. And he described it as that it used to be that people would go out for a dinner and a show and now dinner is the show. And I thought that was a great way of kind of talking about how lifestyles have changed a little bit here. Yeah. Oh, my philosophy. <laughs> yes. You remember your philosophy? Sure. You know, Sorry, to, I'm a little rusty, you guys. I have to tell you the burger thing, which is our first one, yeah. he has to answer. <laughs> I have a lot of friends who are starting taverns and brew pubs, and this is an ongoing conversation. It's like, can you get away without having a burger? What do you think? Can you get away with it? No sure. burger on the menu in a pub. Well, as you said here, I, we did we did pizza. We were, we taught, we toyed with doing barbecue, and we toyed with which I think is still uh, is working and is definitely something to do. Mm -hmm. Schnitzel, schnitzel is wonderful. I love schnitzel. Yes, you're um, speaking to schnitzel lovers here. <laughs> yes, um, I, I I learned recently in two weeks in Germany and Czech Republic that pork goes well with beer apparently because every single place I went to had the pork knuckle and uh, shoulder and everything. Um, it's a cultural thing. 
burger rolls. It's America, right? Um, and uh, and it's also, uh, I think, kind of fits in a lot of other ways, particularly in terms of price. And it's filling. It tends to taste good with beer. There's a lots of good, strong flavors. And it just is something, it's a, it's a marriage. Uh, you add something fried with it, as you typically do, and then you have, you have that, just that kind of uh, match made that is made in heaven that is, goes, goes back to free on. So I think you do the, uh, you know, the, the, the burger, there's a reason why burgers are popular at pubs. Um, in our case, we decided to do pizza because that seemed to be the only thing that we even competed in terms of the, the, the capturing the mind of the, the customer. Um, and uh, pizza pizza is super interesting because, um, as most people know who have any experience in the, uh, the restaurant world, pizza is uh, typically very high profit margin. It's easy to make. Yeah, it, it's quick. Um, you can take someone who's not a trained chef or doesn't even know how to use a knife and teach them how to make pizza pretty easily. And the thing that I really liked um, about pizza at our place, and we served, we did a lot of pizza, um, was that um, pizza's communal. Uh, you know, you can sell a bunch of small pizzas, but if, if you sell bigger pizzas, people are going to share it, and they might even customize one side or the other. But all of a sudden, you have this thing people are sharing, and um, that I thought played into the atmosphere of the place in the, in the best possible way. Um, the other thing is people eat, people might not want to eat red meat or eat something heavy more than once or twice a week. I think burgers people just eat kind of reflexively. But uh, pizza is something that I found that people are happy to eat more than once a week. And they're also happy to eat it at lunch or dinner. And um, so super pizza, super, big thumbs up for pizza, like pizza. So you have a few um, pizza questions here. Spend yes. day pizza? And uh, be concerned about the other pizza places around you. Yeah. Um, well, we, well, when we opened up, there were there were, I think there were already four pizza places in town, and that was my first thought. And then someone reminded me that you know that that that's nothing compared to go to your average small town on the East Coast, and there's four there's a pizza Ria on every single block, and. Um, in our case, I think it, uh, pizza started to really become a big deal here. I think when we started, it was just kind of starting to take off in terms of, uh, and let me be really clear too, that uh, there's different types of pizza. There's, you know, sliced joints and there's um, Neapolitan style pizza, which is typically in a wood-fired oven and it's typically a smaller serving. We did more New York, New York or East Coast style pizza. It was a um, 16 to 18 inch pizza. Um, so there's, there's, there's not just one thing that's pizza. Um, I don't know. I've always felt that uh, that when you do when you do a brew pub, you're trying to create a you're trying to create a holistic environment. You're trying to create something that makes sense and people want to want to flock to. And then, uh, short of having a pizzeria next door, I don't think I would ever even worry about it because. You know, there's a lot of restaurants out there. It doesn't matter where your town is. It's probably going to be one of something you want to do. Um, you know, if you're in Portland, there's 25 of something that you might want to do. And there might be a little different things you can do to make it different. But um, I think that uh, brew pubs are special. They're special in people's minds. Uh, they don't look at it as strictly as a restaurant. It's a restaurant plus. It's a bar plus. There's something about brew pubs that uh, go to the source where you find the freshest product and know where it's being made by craftsmen that is draw of its own and probably supersedes those competitive things from your neighborhood. That's my take. Uh, the question here is spent grain pizza. Uh, I'm not familiar, too familiar with it. I think it, uh, I know that uh, Bridgeport Brewery, which was the first place I knew that did pizza as kind of a, their, their mainstay here in town back in the 80s and was highly successful with it, use uh, spent grain and I think they also use malt syrup in their recipe. There's all kinds of different pizzas, and uh, I didn't—I was not a professional cook when we started our place, but I was able to figure out um, a pretty decent recipe. It's, that's the other thing; it's, it's pretty well and simple. Um, the spent grains thing is kind of a neat thing. I, I tend to kind of shy away from things that, that sound like they might be driven by the marketing department. 
um, which is how I look at that sometimes. Is does it really taste better or not? Um, uh, I think there's you know there's a nice tie in there to say we're being sustainable or using this or that, but um, that's my, everybody has their own take on that. Uh, piece in Chicago, Brian says is great. Yes, that was I think a place is actually quite similar to Double Mountain Brewery in terms of our approach and where we're coming from with pizza too. Yeah, at the same time. People going crazy over this. I think <laughs> Uh, pre spent grain for the rest of us, but they have to carry your beer out. Okay. <laughs> I like that. And uh, the spent grain thing, I think we had something there. Yeah, they're going wild. Go for it. Um, no, I don't know about a spent grain veggie burger. It actually has to yeah. taste good. I don't know. I don't, what else is it? I mean, well, I mean, John has a Faro burger. A fair, I like at Eclectic, the they have a Faro burger and they have That's a beet good. burger. The beet, well, it's not a burger, it's just yeah. beet on pretending to be a burger. It's very good, actually. Yeah, I think they're all, that's all good. I mean, like I said, pizza is really versatile. It's cheap, it's, um, it doesn't require a ton of equipment. I think pizzas, pizzas should be considered. <laughs> so, um, moving on to the slide here. Uh, um, how about your food, your, your beer style with the kind of food? Because people are talking about sausages. Sure. Some of the beer styles go well with sausages instead of burgers. Pork, pork beers versus oh, 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 you, without question, I think that you know pork is um, uh, pork yeah. is uh, and, and sausages and all that are just you know natural. That fellows with beer have been for eons. Um, you know, uh, I think we all know what we like when it comes to beer, and, and one of the, the things there uh, that, that we like to see. Um, yeah, okay. Keep coming, guys. <laughs> it's almost dinner time here in Portland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you, uh, some of the most popular places, uh, I think that the, the kind of more Germanic theme joints, uh, they, it's, it's a little bit of a kind of a narrow road for that type of stuff, but uh, always super popular all over the place. Some of the most popular joints here in Portland and Seattle are actually German joints. Um, okay, working through the slide though, we talked about fine dining. Oops. Yeah. Um, uh, more specialization on the food side, food needs to align with your beverage style. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of great opportunities to um, to do that, and as we see more breweries that are being more specialized, the opportunities just become greater. To be the Belgian brewery with Belgian food, to be the German brewery with German sausages. I totally agree with you there. So let's, uh, let's roll ahead. This is, this is based on a question that we get a lot, is kind of what should I do in my place? And that's one of, to me, one of those, um, it depends. It depends on where you are and who you are and uh, what you want to do. I think that uh, there is, for certain, um, I know in my experience that I, a lot of calls I get from places that might not have a lot of breweries, um, owners are uh, perhaps hesitant to kind of do, they want to kind of do the tried and true, um, and uh, which is fine and, I, and it's completely understandable. Uh, I tend to uh, have a lot of faith these days in the meritocracy of the, the customer and that if you do something good and, and, and it's clear that you put a lot of effort and thought into it and people like it, it's probably going to do well. Um, so I tend not to get too hung up on these types of things. I know here in Portland, for instance, um, it, there seems to be a fair amount of pressure to come up with new ideas because there are so many different outlets that are so good. Uh, that might not be the case where you are. Um, but having said that, I think that, that as with brewing, where um, there's plenty of places that are uh, kind of straightforward, approachable, and they do an excellent job, and there's, they might throw in a wrinkle now and then, then there's other places that all they're all about is the wrinkle and uh, trying to break new boundaries and break new ground. Um, that's what makes it so fun. And fortunately, there seems to be a, a, a plenty of support out there and people that are interested in seeing exactly what you can bring to the table. some time to thinking about food. You know, <clears throat> I go straight here to, is food a core competency of your team? That, um, 
I guess my message to you would be that it's very easy to get yourself psyched out about something like this. Uh, I know my experience proves that um, uh, the same things that made us be good brewers helped us to run a good pub. That we cared about quality ingredients. Um, we cared about doing things the right way. We, you know, were trying to be humble about how we did it, and uh, which is basically it was all part and parcel of trying to provide something good to people, whether it's a beer in the glass or the place where they're going to sit down or what they're going to eat or how they're treated by the server. It's all part of the same thing. And uh, um, so, I, as I said before, I think there's a lot of good economic reasons to do it. There's good marketing reasons to do it. And um, certainly something that can be daunting because it's outside of the, it seems to be outside of the, the core competency, but you'd be surprised that the same things that make you a successful brewery owner can make you uh, be a successful restaurateur at the same time. Um, I think I think we're going to open it up for questions now because we're yeah. gonna, we only have nine minutes left. You guys are throwing all the cups. Come on. What are your thoughts on having <laughs> guest taps? I'm working on yeah. the cidery and I had a hard time thinking of you having no beer on tap, especially as cider still gaining traction. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a cider maker, so you know, I I personally think that um that you could you could go either way and I would I would base it based on maybe a little bit of customer feedback. Uh, I think that yeah you go you do you kind of break new ground you typically expect that yeah you know this might not hit everybody and that, I think that's one of the things you run into when you run a retail establishment is it can be very easy to box yourself in by not being inclusive enough. But at the same time that might be exactly what people want, if, especially if it was a smaller place that's so a little bit more uh, focused. It probably can make an argument in both directions. I think it has. It would have a lot to do with what your, um, you know, what you do, what you're finding for space, and what your expectations are for what you're going to do out of your place. I think that uh, there are a couple places that I've seen popping up that are cider only, um, and very popular. Uh, very popular. I mean, yeah, people. Yes, that, it is Portland, though. Yeah. But Boise, yeah. you know, you never. I think guest taps are, they used to be the guest taps in the brewery thing were, were kind of um, kind of rare because the brewer's impulse is to make as many, have the opportunity to fill as many taps as they can and doesn't want to have to pay somebody else for it or maybe diluting the experience at their bar. Mm -hmm. As time's gone on, especially with so many different beers out there, I don't think those rules apply anymore. I think there's plenty of places that, that actually benefit from having the guest taps. And not only um, maybe you're uh, maybe you're the only brewery in a small town, and you're really trying to reach more people than ones that are just excited want to be there to see you and your beer. Um, maybe your your model is that you're only going to have a few products, and you want to provide more options. I think that my take is that where guest taps used to be kind of rare, I think they're they're a lot more commonplace now, whether it's cider or beer. Yeah, and I, I think it doesn't hurt to have some guest taps. No, I, I think it, it can help, especially yeah. I think in the Boise market, I'd probably go for some guest taps of beer. Yeah, just because not. you know you could have a bunch of different ciders and you could have a few beers, and then it depends on what your model is. If you're really trying to be the you know the, the proselytizer for cider and be the cider central, you might um, you know you might you might kind of lean towards saying no, this is just what we're going to do. But I know, you know, any any pub is going to, I know we were in a tourist town, so we had all kinds of people showing up, but we had to make some decisions on what we were going to offer across the board. They weren't always about what we wanted and what we thought our core customers wanted. And uh, that ranged from the beer selection to the wine selection um, to the, you know, uh, you, you know that's just, that's just part of the calculus. And it really is dependent on what you decide you want to be and what you want to do. And how much of your business it's going to be. Uh, Dan has this question about how big of a disadvantage is having a chain brew pub like Rock Bottom or BJ's located in the same area as your potential brew pub? I think there's, I don't think a problem at all. I think that any kind of, that you'll benefit from the comparison. Uh, I think that, um, we're up to 3,000 breweries in the U.S. now, and there'll be another thousand in like five minutes. Um, 
the whole like this is my neighborhood thing uh, is that game's kind of over in general. Um, and not only that, I don't think it's smart business. I think it's that I personally I would look to open up next to a place that had some foot traffic and um, that you'll all probably benefit by it. You know, you'll probably benefit more than they will. But ultimately, having um, having kind of the nexus of a, a bunch of places in the street, whether they're brew pubs or brew bars and brew pubs, typically only seems to help build that neighborhood as a destination. Uh, special consideration for dealing with mm. the apartment separating beer and food from. I don't think there's anything special, really. Uh, um, I know where we are, they, every state's different. Most of that stuff is state and, and local jurisdictions. I know where we are, um, they, they have to draw the line between being inspected by the Department of Agriculture as a food processing plan or being inspected as a restaurant. And typically they'll choose one or the other based on your size. Um, some places do it on square footage, some places do it on expected volume. Some places do it on just the way the whim of the uh, inspectors. Um, the there's a you know obvious as you can imagine someone who's used to inspecting food plants finds himself in a restaurant. They usually don't know what to do, and typically don't do anything. Um, uh, there's there's a lot to learn about running a restaurant about how health departments work and how you keep them happy and all that. But I wouldn't sweat it in terms of uh, this stuff. Um, did you have to have separate? No. For well, we know here. I don't know. I'm sure in other places that wouldn't be surprised. Separate. But no, typically yeah, we can, the beer can share the cooler with the food, the backup food, um, which is how you end up with lettuce, dried lettuce on top of all the cakes that come back. Um, the, uh, having packaged foods versus full boat food service. Tipping point, creating, uh, yeah, I think that. Uh, well, you, you mentioned Amnesia Brewery here, which was kind of on the, the, the more limited end of the restaurant stuff. I don't, I don't know. I think that the only reason they did that is because they wanted to do as little as possible. And it was super cheap to do, and it worked uh, seasonally very well. And um, it served the purpose of keeping people up there and bringing people that might not otherwise just come for a beer, come for a sausage. The health department stuff, uh, that's just all kind of just it's part of part of learning the business, and it's not too complicated. They typically are not there trying to make you feel bad or do any of those things. They just have certain rules that you have to follow, and you learn how to follow. Someone's asking if you have a role to pay Marcus Devereaux. No, <laughs> sorry, and I look like him. Uh, almost okay. out of time. We probably have time for one more question. Yeah, one spot. <laughs> Uh, no more questions? Everybody's signing off? Anything else? Well, we're gonna, you're going to see a food lecture next week, so, and then you'll, Good. you know, for those of you who are into food, you're going to have a, well, all of you will have a chance to go and do a restaurant analysis for a pub and just do an estimate of how much money you think they're making on food by looking at their menu and looking at the seats. And that's really fun. More fun than doing the forecasting. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you, Charlie, for coming. Sure. Thanks, you guys, a for pleasure. showing up. Another. See you in Denver, whoever's going to be there. Yep, so we'll see you all in Denver in a few weeks. Good night. <laughs>